first topic that I dealt with is the issue of Gnosticism. Gnosticism, which is a common objection to when we teach about Jewish hermeneutics is the idea of Gnosticism. Remember, uh, the grammatical, historical grammatical uh, approach to scripture that came out in the 1500s, it was a reaction to the mysticism of Roman Catholicism. It was a reaction to their hermeneutics. So that's when it came out, when, when, when that was brought out, it was a reaction to that. Right? It was a reaction to Roman Catholicism. So we have to be you know, aware of that, uh, the Gnostic hermeneutics that it is in Roman Catholicism. When we get into Jewish hermeneutics, right, it's like peeling an onion. There is the straightforward meaning, and then you keep going deeper and deeper, but you start with the literal straightforward meaning. It's not Gnosticism. It's the straightforward meaning that then connects with other scriptures and other words. And there's, there's wonderful things you find out um, when you apply this Jewish hermeneutics to your, um, to your study. You begin to see uh, these typology, corporate solidarity, and things that it's, it's there. It's not something you're making up. It's already in the scriptures, but you're drawing out of it. By the Spirit, you're drawing out these things that are already there. Now we're looking at the Scripture the way the apostles did. Uh, the apostles looked at the Scriptures not from, uh, you know, not the way we would look at in 21st century America, but the way a first century apostolic believer. I always had this challenge to Christians. What you believe today, right, if you were to walk into a first century church, would, you, would they consider you a Christian? Right? Well, they considered you a Christian. The way you believe and the way you live, you walked into the book of Acts, and Peter was your pastor. <laughs> well, they say he's a brother, she's a sister. Remember in Acts, it tells us not many joined them because of the fear, because they lived the holy life. They looked at them with holy reverence, that they lived for the Lord in that holiness, and they loved the Lord, and they loved the Word, and they were in fellowship from house to house, sharing with each other, loving on each other. And many people were afraid of that because they couldn't join them in hypocrisy. They could not join them in hypocrisy. So my challenge to us, let's put it the other way. What a first century Christian that walked through those doors, well, they say we're Christians by the way we believe and by the way we live, right? That's the challenge for today. And that's a challenge for all of our lives is, you know, what it meant to them in the early church, the way they understood scripture, Jesus, his coming, his coming again. Is that in line with how we view the scripture? So this is why it's so important to get back to not patristic, right? Not patist patristic, but apostolic. Going back to what Paul, John, Peter, and the apostles taught. And, and that's going to take studying. That's going to take prayer. That's going to take... Uh, the Lord leading us to that because we're, we need to go back to that apostolic faith, the faith of the apostles. Um, I thank the Lord for a resurgence of that in the body of Christ. There are believers who have been captured by the Lord, but have been captured their mind by the Lord, and they realize that the church needs to go back to that, and they begin to emphasize it and teach it and show it, and they begin to address these things that largely, maybe since around maybe the 400s, 300, 400 A.D., where the church became Hellenized, right? When the church became Hellenized, we started using Aristotle's philosophy and, and, and Plato's philosophy of how to look at Scripture, and you had origin, spiritualizing it completely way out of, uh, out of all reasonable context. The church began to lose that in touch, being in touch with the root, right? The apostles' hermeneutics, the apostles' way of looking at Scripture. So... Um, welcome back. Hopefully lunch wasn't that heavy. Uh, it's, I've always been told the session after lunch is the hardest one because the blood is rushing to your stomach and very little is up here <laughs> and people tend to lose out. But it was a light lunch, right? It was light lunch unless you had pizza. Or, yeah, amen. Thank you, Dennis. Brother David Nathan. Come on up, brother. Thank you, Marco. 
Praise the Lord. Well, survive the first two sessions, and that gets really, really interesting, and we're going to start learning some real good stuff. So let's commit our time to the Lord. Father God, we bless you for that. Your word is true, yea, and amen, that you watch over your word, my God, Lord, to perform it. Father, that we can stand on your word. We can trust you for every single thing that is in it. So, Lord, as we learn how to understand what you have written, to, to search out, Lord, the, the treasures of your word, please, O oh God, be with us. Lord, be present by your spirit. Change our hearts. Let your word wash over us, transform us, and conform us into your image in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you see, the uh, word pardes has been on your screen for some time now. Uh, from South Africa, I don't know how you spell party in Spanish, so I thought it's pardes, so after lunch we'll not... We'll just party a little bit there, eh? <laughs> How's that for a Spanish accent? Make huh? Latino. <laughs> it's okay. I'll tell you, I've got, I've got one very good joke, but I won't tell it now. Um, Where are we? Part of this. Da, 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 da. Right, let's go. Right, the rabbinical, the rabbis, the Jews, the scholars, they understood that in the study of Torah, there were four fundamental branches of study, or four tracts of studying the Torah, the Hebrew Scriptures. The Torah is more accurately uh, the, the Hebrew for the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. The Jews tend to study that above anything else, so the, the Katuvim, and, and, uh, which is the writings, the Psalms, the books of wisdom, and uh, the Nevi'im, the prophets. The, the rabbis focus on Torah. And so when they approach the Torah, they, they, they use four disciplines, four ways of understanding the text. And this is not just the modern rabbis, but this was a a way of study that uh, the, uh, the apostles would have been exposed to, C certainly the likes of Barnabas and, and Paul and, and perhaps Apollos, would have understood this is how we uh, interpret Scripture. Now, it's more of an understanding than it is something that you're born with. A Jew isn't born with a certain mindset. We're born just like any other child. We're sponges. But we grow up in a culture where we approach things very differently. So in a, Jew, in a Jewish home, uh, when a child asks a question, the parents won't necessarily give them a direct answer. Unlike in a non-Jewish home. A non-Jewish home, little boy, little, you know, your child points to a tree and says, what's that? And you'll answer. It's, it's an apple tree. It's a, it's a grape tree. It's a palm tree. In Jewish home, the parent will say, what do you think it is? And you, if you, visit, you might not know many Jewish people, but if, if you have a relation with a Jewish person, you'll notice that they, they, they never seem to give you a straight answer. You know, and, uh, when I'm around uh, Christians that, that tolerate me, they'll ask me how I am. And I always say, well, how, do you really want to know? <laughs> and I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm saying... Are you just being polite or do you want to engage in conversation? And when you read Scripture, that's certainly the way the, the Apostle Paul taught. He would pose questions, give seemingly ridiculous answers, and then spend the rest of the chapter expounding his answer in light of his question. Questions, answers, always questioning, always investigating. This is the Jewish mindset. That's why you hear the, um, you know, the, the story, you get, if you get... Two Jewish people in conversation, you're bound to get three opinions. <laughs> so it's not some, it's something that we grow up with. We're always questioning. We're always asking why. What is the motive? What is the purpose? We don't, Jews, Jews culturally, don't just accept. So we're not, unlike the, the Greek way of, of, of learning and, and the Greek culture is, your parents speak, you do. And the Jewish culture is your parents explain why they do what they do. They provoke you to think. Yeah, you're getting that. So the Bible is written like that. God provokes us to search out His Word. 
He provokes us to search out His work. So there are four disciplines in interpreting Scripture. These four branches or levels are called, these are the, collectively are called pardes. Pardes. And must be applied to fully understand and interpret Scripture. Now, pardes is an acronym for these four levels. The first one is peshat. You can spell it however you want to. It's a Hebrew word. Peshat. The second, remez. The third, drash. And the fourth, pronounced sud, as in wood. Not sud, as in bud. Sud. So, part of this is an acronym for peshat, remez, drash, and sud. What is the peshat? When we approach Scripture, the Peshat, the first level of biblical interpretation called the Peshat is the literal or plain or the intended meaning. What, is, what do we mean by that? When you read a portion of Scripture, what the Bible says is what the Bible means. It's not a hidden mystical interpretation. Now, some of you have heard of Kabbalah. Right? Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. It is occultish. And the Kabbalists teach that the Torah, the first five books of Moses, what you see on the surface is there to hide enlightenment from those who seek no enlightenment. So what you read, everything you read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, not true. In six days he created, not true. On the seventh day he rested, not true. He created Adam and Eve, not true. It's there as a smoke screen for the uninformed, but for those who are pursuers of light, the, me the meaning is in the symbolism. So from there we get the gematria and we get all the mystical, uh, the the, the, the Zorah and all the mystical books. That is not what the, uh, the, uh, the rabbis, certainly in antiquity, used to believe and what the apostles believed. The Pesha, the simple reading of the text, is the meaning of the text. There is no hidden meaning. There is no, sorry, let me rephrase it. There's no alternate meaning, meaning, right? So if you take any portion of Scripture, it says what it means, and it means what it says. There is no alternate interpretation. There is one interpretation. It is the peshat. It is the intended me meaning. It is what God intended to say. So turn anywhere in your Bible. We'll do what Marco told us not to do, and he's 100% right. But just for sake of illustration... We don't want to do the Judas one. Yeah, let's, I'll just open up to Isaiah chapter, chapter 63. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bozra, the one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? Okay, we know who this guy is now, don't we? That's right. It is literally speaking about the Lord. It's literal. So that's the Peshat. Every time you read the Bible, every, every verse of Scripture you read, the Peshat is the intended meaning. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Christ has come to give us life and life in abundance. That's what the Scripture means. It doesn't mean anything else. It doesn't mean that if you join the dark side, then you will be able to kill, steal, and destroy from others. Especially those who have, think they have abundant life. You know, it's, it's a nonsensical illustration. But people read beyond what is written. The Peshat is simply what the Bible says is what the Bible means. Got it? Right, so why do we need anything else? Why must there be more? Why must there be deeper, deeper truths? Why deeper layers to what is simply... In a text. Well, we'll get into that. 
The R, the Resh, Remez, a hint. Sometimes scripture hints that there is more. Yes, the Remez. But we're going to, we're going to go into each one of these quite deeply. Drash means to search, to search out, to dig. Sud is hidden. These are the four levels. We have the Pesha, the literal interpretation, the plain text, the plain understanding. We have the Remez. Within a plain text, there is a hint of something deeper. Then you get the Drash. It is a call to search out from Scripture. We start to see, in our searching, we start to see patterns. And we begin to compare these patterns and compare these, these truths we're seeing. And we then, as we're comparing, we're now forming a midrash. Midrash, to compare from the drash. The drash, we search out. We find patterns. We find similarities. We find connections. And as we put these connections together, from that which we have searched out, and we begin to compare them, we are now forming Midrash. A Midrash is to bring together that which seems to be a part, but is interconnected. So if you can imagine, I was chatting uh, over lunch about this, if you can imagine the, the Word of God and, and the doctrines of God and that which the Lord wants us to, to understand, it's like a bowl of spaghetti. It looks like a mess, but everything is actually in interconnected. Genesis and Revelation, the first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of, of Revelation are mirror images. They literally mirror images. You put them side by side. In the beginning, God created. Revelation, God recreates. God brings a man into the garden and gives him a wife. In Revelation, the bride of, of Christ comes down into a recreated earth, into a garden. Eve comes out of the side of Adam. The last Adam, Christ, has his side pierced to birth his wife, his bride. See that? Midrash. Searching out similarities, putting them together. You're not creating a new doctrine. You, you're not teaching anything the Bible doesn't teach, but you're putting together things that seem to be unrelated. They're opposite sides of the Bible, but through the strands of God's genius, they're all interconnected. That's how you need to see the Bible. It's like a mind map. It's all related. It's not linear. It's not in the beginning God created and ends with His return. That is the over, overview. But everything between Genesis and Revelation is all intertwined. And what Midrash is, it's using the drash, using the searched out things to bring and to compare them to form an understanding. And then finally, Sud is that which is hidden, that which is mysterious, that which can only be, re be revealed either by the Holy Spirit or at a set time in history. The Sud. That which can only be opened either by the Holy Spirit or at a specific time in history. Right. Got that. Easy, isn't it? Four levels. Pesha, simple understanding, the intended meaning. Remez, a hint that there's something more to that verse. Drash, to search out, to look for. Sud, that which is hidden. And of course, as you can see, that the first letter of each word, P-R-D-S, is taken. The vowels, of course, are added because in Hebrew there are no vowels. And we get the acronym Pardes. And in Hebrew, Pardes means an orchard. It is used in the Song of, of Solomon. An orchard. Now, when you go into an orchard, let's say you go into a grape orchard. Or a... Something else, a lemon orchard, an orange. Let's we find, go into an orange orchard. Well, you take of the fruit, and you bite into it, and you have the taste of orange. The pesha. It's an orange. It looks like an orange. It tastes like an orange. It's an orange. 
but you then take the skin of the orange and, and, and you, you crush it. And there's a hint of the fragrance. There's a hint of something more. But now, if you take the orange and you look at its properties, and you think, what can I, what can I do with this orange? Well, I can apply it as an air freshener. I can dry it out. I could make a preserve out of it. It has, other, it has medicinal benefits. It's got vitamin C in it. The, the, there's more to the orange than just the taste now. There's more to the orange than just the fragrance. It now has a deeper value to me. And of course, there's the hidden truths. You could let it ferment. You can get an orange liqueur. <laughs> it's an orchard. As you go through an orchard, you, you see on so many planes, you see the obvious, you taste the obvious. But there's fragrances in the orchard. There's medicinal uh, uh, properties within the plants in the orchard. Such is pardes. Such is the word of God. At every level, there's blessing. In every level, there's benefit. But this, the plain meaning of a text never changes. No matter how deep you get, the plain meaning is always the intended meaning. Now, we're going to see this illustrated. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time illustrating these things, if that is all right. Part of this. Each layer of part of this is deeper and more intense in its revelation and understanding of the text than the previous layer. So as you go deeper, the, the revelation just becomes just more incredible. And there might be a few oohs and ahs as we go on later on this afternoon as I begin to unravel part of this to you. But each layer, no matter how intense the revelation as you go deeper, each layer is based and built on the correct understanding of that which precedes it. In other words, the simple intended meaning always remains the same. When I go deeper, it doesn't change the layer before. Everything gets built precept upon precept. It is line upon line. This is how God builds doctrine through His Word. Line upon line, precept upon precept. This is how the Word of God is written. When we read the book of Genesis, we have a hint at salvation. God, through the seed of the woman, is going to somehow undo what happened at the fall. But as we read more and more Scripture, as God reveals His plan of redemption further and further, you know, through, through, through Moses, Moses points us to another prophet, the, uh, the, the, the prophets point us to a Messiah figure, the Messiah comes and it's still quite vague, His disciples don't understand Him until the very end. You know, Mark made a, a comment, which is very true, that white piece of paper between Malachi and um, the Gospels should be taken out. Can somebody tell me uh, when the Old Testament ended? That's right. You know, that it's only the last couple of chapters in each of the Gospels that are New Testament. Everything else is Old Testament. Jesus came under law to minister to those under law to bring in the New Covenant. So until His resurrection, everything prior to His resurrection is the Old Testament. Did you know that? It's Old Testament. Jesus never ministered to one Christian. He didn't heal for one saved, he didn't heal one saved person. Every miracle he performed, he performed on unsaved people. Every sermon he preached, he preached to unsaved people. Interesting, is it? Anyway, it was for free. Let's get back to our slide. One layer never contradicts or diminishes, nor replaces the interpretation and understanding of the previous. Please, saints, hear this. As we dig into the Word of God, there is never a contradiction. The intended meaning, the peshat meaning, the simple, plain text, is never contradicted by the remes, or by the uh, drash, or by the sud. It is never. It must remain true. That is why you, 
you know, I, I do get irate with certain false doctrines because they're not applying simple Hebraic accurate hermeneutics. We have the, yes, that simple text says this, but. But that. You know, uh, goats, but sheep follow. What is written is what the Bible means. So when the Bible says something, a verse says something, that's what it means. No matter how deep you go, it never changes the simple interpretation. Got it? All right. Excellent. Right. First one. In pardes. Peshat. Pronounce Peshat or Peshat. Peshat or Peshat. You can either pronounce the H or... Right, Peshat. Often, it's, in, it's often inaccurately translated as the simple meaning of the text. And why is it inaccurate to say it's a simple meaning? It's, that's because sometimes the Word of God is not simple. So it's better to be seen as the intended or the explicit meaning of a text or passage. So the Peshat is what God meant us to see and understand. It is the intended or the explicit meaning of a text or passage. And as I just said now, this is not always simple to grasp or understand. There, there are mysteries in the, in the things of God. There are things that are hard for us to understand. But the intended meaning is the intended meaning. So it's not simple. It's just intended. Got it? Have I confused you? Okay, I, I, I come from South Africa, so we're not always that bright here. But uh, they, I should say. All right, the Peshat is the keystone of scripture and of, scr of scripture understanding. As I said earlier on, unlike Kabbalah and Christian mysticism, which declares that the written text is there to conceal the true and under, underlying meaning of the mysteries, Peshat regards the plain meaning of the text as paramount to its understanding. I'm just reiterating what I've been saying. The cults. And the occult always disguise the true meaning of what they believe or their intent. It's always disguised. So if, if you want to join the, the Masons, you can come in and swear on the, on, on the God of your Bible. They only reveal who they really are as you go deeper down. That's how Satan works. Satan works in darkness. So as you go deeper, so it becomes darker. Whereas God has got a light. It starts off light and gets even lighter. Okay. If we discard the Peshat, if we discard the intended meaning of a verse or a text, we lose any real chance of an accurate understanding, and we are no longer objectively deriving meaning from the Scriptures. You can't lose the Peshat. You can't lose the intended meaning. When you deviate from that, there's no way you can objectively derive any further meaning from the Scriptures. So, we continue. Even with the Peshat, which is, intent, which is the intended or plain meaning of the text, you'll still find various types of language, such as literal, figurative, or symbolic, and allegorical. So when you read, as we looked at earlier on when we were looking at hermeneutics, you can read a text and what it says and what it means, but you've still got to understand it in its literal form, literally for, literary form. Is it a metaphor? Is it a simile? Is, 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 is he using allegory? Uh, what, you've got to understand the language of it. You also got to un un understand uh, its, its historical uh, context, etc., as we have seen before. So the Peshat is the intended meaning, but you still got to look at the Peshat through the laws of hermeneutics, which Marco and I covered before lunch, if we recall, pre-Turkey sandwich. Peshat is the natural understanding of Scripture in its normal sense using the customary meanings of the words being used. Literary style, sorry, literary style, historical, cultural setting, and context. Here is an example. Let's see this worked out, a Peshat of Matthew 16, 24. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. How do I understand this using the hermeneutics that we were taught earlier on and through Peshat interpretation? Well, let's ask ourselves the question. Who is Jesus speaking to? Directly? Yes. Directly? He's with his disciples. He's talking to his disciples. And as we heard earlier on, he's, he was speaking to them. But indirectly, he's talking to us. If anyone desires to come after me, he's talking to his disciples. Marco, is it okay if anybody decides to join this church? Would it be all right? Right. So I'm having a conversation with Marco. Marco says, anyone who wants to join this church can. Now I go out into town and I say, listen guys, if you're looking for a church, you get to Devor, the pastor has said you can come there. I'm taking a conversation I've had with him and now I'm applying it to others. Jesus is talking to his disciples, but indirectly, He's talking to anyone. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. So who's he talking to? Anyone who wishes to, including his disciples, who were the first to hear this word of Jesus. What is the context? What is the Peshat? Why is he saying this? What is Jesus wanting to communicate? Well, is there anyone, any person who desires? Or is there anyone only the predestined who are predestined to desire? Now, I'm not trying to be facetious. But what I'm trying to illustrate is we've got bad doctrine in our churches because we are not applying sound hermeneutic. Who's he speaking to? Disciples, for whom? Only them? No, for anyone who desires. What is the context? Anyone who desires to follow Jesus must deny himself and take up his cross. That's the context. Anyone from the Greek, itis, meaning whoever, whatever, whosoever, or any man. So it is a Inclusive phrase. It's not exclusive. Christ is including all. All who desire are welcome to come after him providing. Providing what? They deny themselves and take up the cross. Therefore, the context is that any person can follow Jesus provided they are willing to conform to the requirements. From the Hebraic mindset, we see Covenant. We see covenant flashing at us. So, so this is what we're seeing. We're seeing, okay, this is covenant talk. If then, if then. This is the language of Scripture. It's not confined to the Old Testament. It's the language of Scripture. God is a God of covenants. And covenant requires each party to fulfill certain obligations. This is how God dealt with the patriarchs. It's how he dealt with the nation of Israel. It's how he deals with the church. The ifs and the thens. It is covenant talk. I often say to people, did God make a covenant with the Jews and just pour grace on the Gentiles? Is it just an old covenant and no new covenant. On Pesach, on Passover, on the 14th day of the first month, in an upper room in Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus Christ took out the elements of covenant. The lechem, the bread, the yayin, the wine. And he says, this is the New covenant. He didn't pour grace on the church. 
he made a covenant of grace. With Moses, he made a covenant of law. With his disciples, he made a covenant of grace. But they both are covenants. Did you see that? One required the sacrificial the sacrifice of animals. The other is entered into through the grace of God. There's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. There's nothing that we can do uh, to make ourselves righteous and acceptable to God. The salvation comes through the finished work of Calvary. It comes through the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. But it's a covenant, which means that I have to agree to the covenant. I've got to do what the covenant requires of me. That's why Jesus says, he who has my word and does it, this is he who loves me. So there is, this is covenant talk. If you obey me, if you hold fast, it's not that God doesn't want us in the covenant. It's not that we have to work for, for our salvation. We can't work. But once we are saved, once we have been uh, accepted by the Lord and the Spirit of God indwells us, He gives us the grace to remain in the covenant. And it's easy because we're so full with the love and the mercy of God that we don't want to go back. But that doesn't mean I'm not free to go back. It is a covenant. Okay, so therefore the context, as Jesus is saying, is speaking to, as, as he's speaking, is that any person can follow. Again, and I'm not, Jews aren't better than Christians or, or Gentiles. We're not. We're just as sinful, just as wicked, the same sin nature that you have, we have. All right? The only difference is we like smoked salmon and you like bacon. Yeah. <laughs> But we're not better. God doesn't love us more. Uh, God wants us all saved equally. The only difference is how we approach the Word of God. Do you see? The only difference that you and I is how you and I approach the Word of God. If you haven't been exposed to this type of teaching, we're going to approach the Word of God differently. So when I read the Word of God, I read Jesus... Uh, the teaching of Jesus, I'm seeing covenant. I'm seeing the God of the Old Testament. I'm seeing Jesus who appeared firstly to Abraham. You know it was Jesus who appeared to Abraham in Genesis. Melchizedek, Melech Tzedek, Melech King Tzedek, righteousness, Melech Tzadi, the king of Salem, the ancient name of Yerushalayim. Right? He was priest of God Most High. He was the high priest of a priesthood not yet formed. I mean, who else is that? Who is the king of kings? Who is the lord of the king of peace? Who is the king of righteousness? And who is our high priest? Uh, got it? Yeah, yeah Jesus. Kind of obvious, isn't it? Yeah, the same Jesus who appears to Abraham, uh, sorry, to Moses in the burning bush. I am that I am. It's, it's Jesus. It's the angel of the Lord who was in the, the column of, 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 of uh, fire. Or the pillar of fire and the column of smoke or... or that one. It was the angel of the Lord. It's God. This same Jesus that made covenant with Abraham, made covenant with Moses, who was with the children of Israel, is the same Jesus that appears in the upper room centuries later to make a new covenant. He is the Almighty who changeth not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How he dealt with Israel is how he deals with the Gentiles. He cannot change. There is no changing God. As Balaam, under the Holy Spirit, declares in the book of Numbers, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change. Has he not spoken, and shall he not perform it? God is unchangeable. So I read that as a Jew. That the God who made covenant with my ancestors is the God who hung on a cross. As he dealt with Israel, he'll deal with, he'll deal with the church. Do you see the difference? I, I don't draw a line. As Marcus said, I don't look at that white page and see, right, that's it. Everything BC is irrelevant. Now, we, we see a continuation. So, so we look at the Scriptures, and the way we should look at the Scriptures is the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Everything in the New Testament is found in the Old. But the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. All God's purposes are brought to light through the understanding of the new. They're not two separate books. Each are interpreted through the other. Because the God who made covenant in the old is the same God who made covenant in the new. 
Therefore, the laws of the kingdom do not change. Remember, we were dealing with the kingdom of God. So the laws of the kingdom were set in eternity past. They don't change between covenants. The laws of the kingdom don't change between covenants. God deals the same way. He deals the same way with Israel as he does with the church. There is zero difference. In fact, it appears that God was more gracious with Israel under law than he is with the church under grace. Yeah. You know, it took God 700 years before he brought the judgments of Deuteronomy 28 upon the nation of Israel. 700 years when he said to them, if you go after the gods, I'll take you out the land. I'll bring oppressors upon you. That was fulfilled 700 years later. How's that for grace? The, church, the churches of Revelation, 700 years later, they were gone. 500 years later. How, how, how long did they last? A couple of hundred years. If that, God was more gracious with Israel under law than he has been with the church under grace. Because to whom much is given, much is required. Okay. Right, so what is the context of what Jesus is saying? That those who desire to follow him must deny themselves and take up their cross. This is the context. Okay. Now, culturally and historically, what did these disciples hear? Let me ask you a question. What is Jesus saying? Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. What does that mean to you? Die to self. Okay, to suffer. Yeah. That we well that that yeah okay that, that's an outworking of that. Was the point was the Romans would crucify people on the cross? Well, there you go. See, now, you, go, Robert, you got it. You see, we read it and immediately we contextualize it into our, our cultural experience. I've got to deny myself, okay, I've got to give up my hobbies, I've got to go to church more. I've got to take my cross, ah, oh, there's going to be suffering. That's how we understand it. But no, if you were listening to Jesus, deny myself, give up... My rights, give up yeah, my way of life, take up my cross. Well, we've seen people take up their cross. It normal, it, it's always worked out to be a one-way trip. We have watched people take up their cross as they pick up the instrument of their execution, dragging the instrument of their own execution to their own deaths. It's a one-way trip. Dead man walking. In... Its historical uh, setting, the uh, disciples understood that to follow Jesus means I have to die. Not just give up, die. I have to cease to exist in terms of my rights, my will, my way. This is an all or nothing deal. What Marcus said, that question that he posed to us just now, was, you know, if we were to go back to the first century, you know, to, to be amongst apostles, would they regard us as Christians and vice versa? That is something we need to ask ourselves because they gave up their lives, literally, because they were willing to literally consider the taking up of a cross. They knew what Jesus was saying. Am I willing to die for Jesus? You see, we love debating doctrine and all this kind of stuff. But you know, when the rubber meets the road and somebody puts a gun to your head and says, deny Jesus or die, you know, all your fancy arguments and all your theologies and all your... Don't count for Jack. Historical and cultural setting. I need to be prepared to die. That has not changed. That's still the requirement to give up all for Christ. 
And that is why I believe we have all these conflicts in the church, because if you truly gave all to Jesus, you'd never think about falling away. If you truly approach the cross and approach the grace of God with that understanding that it took for in order for Christ to redeem you and I, he had to give up his life. And the only way I can enter into eternal life is to reciprocate. You see, this is covered in talk. God will fulfill certain obligations in order to be part of the, the covenant or a beneficiary of that covenant. I must, in turn, fulfill certain obligations. And here it is, to deny oneself. So what would have meant, culture, and sorry, to the hearers, okay, Culture is become a follower of, to become a follower, or in the Greek, mathetis, mathetis, a disciple. Now, a disciple, to the hearers, that word disciple it had a very different connotation to what it means to us. Are you a disciple of Jesus? I haven't met too many disciples of Jesus. I've met a lot of churchgoers. I've met very few disciples. You see, we don't, our understanding of the word disciple is very different nowadays as, as it was back then. A disciple to the hearers, as Jesus was speaking, what they understood a disciple to be was one who had literally given up their way of life to follow after another's. They exchanged one understanding, one worldview, one way of living life. They had surrendered that to follow after another's and to be instructed by them. Jesus is never an add-on. He's never an add to your life. He must become your life. He must become your master. He must become your Lord. We don't choose what to obey and what not to obey. When we become a disciple of Christ, he must become our all in all. This is what they understood. Very different to us. You see, we still preach in the church a very cheap grace. Come to Jesus. Everything's going to be all right. Come to Jesus. You know, ask Jesus to come into your heart. As much as the Lord would like to come into your heart, He would prefer to come into your entire life. Okay, it's an all or nothing thing. And historically, as we, as we uh, saw, a cross was an instrument of death. Hence, the minimum price of discipleship was death to oneself. So when the Apostle Paul writes in, in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore by the uh, mercies of God that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and, acceptable, holy and acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. What he's saying is, unless you prepare to go into the altar, yield your life to God, surrender all to the Lord, you're not cutting it, because that's your reasonable, it's, it's your minimum I mean, can we get a fan on? It's getting really, really warm in here. I can see folk uh, are fanning themselves, and just now they're going to be grasping for air. And <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've got water. Just, I'm just concerned about you. you know, shepherd cares for the flock. Okay. Right, Peshat. Right, so then Jesus. Okay, that's it. Let's go. It's customary meaning. A follower of Jesus must be willing to deny themselves and take up their cross. Literary style, Jesus is using metaphor. Now we're we applying hermeneutics. Metaphor, comparisons. Context, anyone can be a follower culturally. To become a follower or disciple, the Greek word, mathetis, was to become a disciple, and historically a cross was the instrument of death. Right, all got the pesha. Pesha. It means what it means. It means what it says, but we still need to apply hermeneutics. So hermeneutics always get applied to the peshat, to the simple, literal, intended meaning. Okay. Now we go one level deeper. We peel off another layer and we get to the remes. The remes. It means a hint. A passage of Scripture is hinting at more. I understand the intended meaning. It's clear. But somehow it's calling me to examine deeper, to, to, to think deeper, to, to look deeper into it. So this is where another implied meaning is alluded to in the text, usually revealing a deeper meaning, the peshat, 
meaning re remains unchanged, but there is a hint of a deeper meaning too. So, as we said, the Peshat never changes, but there's a hint of something deeper. And so we look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 10 as an example. Proverbs 20, verse 10, diverse weights and diverse measures, they are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Different weights, different measures, the same thing. They're both abominations to God. Okay, diverse weights, diverse measures. Okay, what am I reading? Okay, I'm in Proverbs. Um, 900 years, 850 years before Jesus. I'm in, in Jerusalem. When I'm, why am I using scales? I'm in the marketplace. Anybody ever been to the Middle East? Hey, just do a course in haggling, bargaining before you go. <laughs> they like to haggle. They like to bargain. If they can do you in a bit, they'll do you in a bit. It's business. It's not personal. <laughs> they started it. You guys have perfected it. So the Peshat is that God dis disapproves of unjust scales in the market. He doesn't want his people robbing each other. God hates thieves. He ha it's, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not cover thy, you know, thy neighbor's wife. You need to, you, we need to trade and conduct our business and our, and our affairs in honesty. Yeah, God despises thievery. The Peshat, that's, the, that's what's intended. Make sure that your scales are checked. Make sure that your, that your ounce is accurate, that your pound is accurate, that people get what they're paying for. So why is it in the Bible? I mean, kind of, it's common sense, isn't it? So there must be more, the, in, more to this than that. I mean, is, is God really that concerned about scales and measures? You're seeing the remedies here. The Pesha, the simple interpretation, the intended meaning is quite plain. Conduct your business ethically. There's going to be more to that than that. Well, what is God really saying? Well, perhaps that God is more concerned with the measures we use one to another than with the scales of business. Really, in the scripture, there's something about that? Well, so glad you asked. Yes, Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Scales and measures. Matthew 7, verse 1 and 2. Judge not that you may, that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. interesting. Yeah, Luke's, yeah, Luke's account is, is even more interesting in Luke chapter 7. If we can turn this scene as we have all afternoon, I think Marcus said what we're going to end at midnight, was that right? <laughs> I thought she said that. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> but in, Luke, in, Luke, in Luke's account, in Luke 6 verse 37, Jesus says, Luke 6, 37, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Right? So we take Proverbs chapter 20, verse 10, which talks about weights and measures in the marketplace. And when the Lord comes, he starts to talk about Weights and measures in how we relate one to another. So if you're going to use a crooked scale, if you're going to use a, a, a bent scale in judging other people hip, hypocritically, God will say, fine. I will apply on the day of judgment your measure, not mine. Remes. When we read Proverbs, we understand the intended meaning. Pesha. But Rem is, is, is provoking us to go deeper. So I bear them in mind measures. God has an issue with measures and, and, and scales. But as I begin to come into the Gospels now, 
Jesus starts using the same terminology, measures. How you measure, it will be measured back to you. You see how Remus works? The Bible is enticing us to look deeper. The Word is enticing us to dig down. That is Remes. Another example of Remes, which Jacob uh, Presh quotes very often, is Matthew 2, verse 15, where Matthew writes, Out of Egypt I called my son. And he's referring back to Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1. The only thing, though, is if we read Hosea 11, verse 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. So Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, the prophet Hosea is not saying that God called his son. It says that God called Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son, Israel being the son of God. So how does Matthew write in, in, in chapter 2 verse 15 when uh, Joseph takes the family to Egypt that this is a fulfillment. What he's saying is this is a fulfillment of Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, that out of Egypt I called my son. When Hosea 11 verse 1 clearly says out of Egypt I called Israel my son. This is what we call a direct remes interpretation. The, the Pesha is yes, Jesus did go down to Egypt. That's clear. He did go down to Egypt to, to flee the persecution of Herod. And when Herod had passed away, the angel told Joseph to move back to Israel. But what is God speaking about? What is there something more than just the fact that Jesus went to Egypt and God called him out? Is there a deeper meaning? Well, of course. If we stuck to the Peshat, the literal exegesis only, and research the quote, we find that Hosea is speaking about Israel and not the Messiah. Matthew, however, is hinting, he's using a remez at the relationship between Israel and the Messiah. In this and other verses he uses. Well, let, well let's, let's just think about this for, for a moment. Who else went down to Egypt? Abraham, Abraham. Anyone else? Yosef, Joseph, anyone else? The entire family of Israel, right, under Jacob, went down to Egypt. And God called his people, Israel, out of Egypt. But in doing so, he first brought judgment onto Egypt. He gave the Jews the Passover ceremony to atone for their sins so that the avenging angel would not bring destruction upon them. So they had to take a lamb without blemish. They had to slaughter it, put the blood upon the lintel and the doorposts, doorposts and lintel. They had to remain under the blood and the wrath of God passed over them. As he brings them out of Egypt with the Lamb of God digesting inside them, he takes them through the Red Sea, a type of baptism, to Mount Sinai, Pentecost, for the giving of the law before he brings them into the promised land, Canaan. Well, that is a typology of our salvation. Egypt, the world in bondage. Israel, you have the Israel of God. That is Jew and, Jew and Gentile who believe in Jesus Christ, washed in the blood of Christ. Only possible through his son. So what Matthew is doing by the Spirit of God, he's bringing the association of Israel and Christ as Christ and his people, as God brought Israel out of Egypt, so through Christ, he brings us out of bondage, through salvation, into baptism, to Sinai, where we receive the word. Okay, Remes. 
It doesn't make sense. It causes us to search. When you read Scripture, when things niggle at you, you want to know more? It's a spirit provoking you. Go search out. Go look deeper. This is what a rem is. is. A call of the spirit to go deeper. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. Sometimes a rem is can be really hidden. You'd, you'd need to know the original languages. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, Christ calls himself the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, bearing in mind that the Hebrew alphabet only has 22 letters and begins with Aleph and ends with Tav, Aleph Tav. So Jesus in Greek is the Alpha and Omega. In English, he is the A and Z. In Hebrew, he's the Aleph and Tav. He's the beginning and he's the end. He's the first and the last. All things were created by him. All things were created through him and all things were created for him. He was before all things and will be after all things. He is the eternal God. Jesus is the Almighty. He is, was not created as a Jehovah's Witness say. He is an eternal being, equal to the Father, always having existed. And the Bible declares this over and over again under our very own noses and we can't see it. Psalm 145, verse 1. Can you see the glory of God? What am I looking at, David? Looking at Psalm 145, verse 1, in the Hebrew. Every line of the psalm begins with a consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet, beginning with Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yud all the way to Tav. You read Psalm 145, and we, we don't read Hebrew. We don't see this. But a, a Hebrew, a Jew, reading Psalm 145 in the original languages, sees every verse, starting with Aleph, going to Bet, every verse starts off with the next letter, the alphabet. And have you ever read Psalm 145? Bearing that in mind, do you want to read it now? I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I will extol you, O my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. You're reading this. I'll meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. And Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. I am the Alpha and Omega. I'm the Aleph and Tav. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on, the wondrous, and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the, of the might of your awesome acts. And I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all. And His tender mercies are over all His works. Saints, He's the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the author and the finisher of your faith. I am the one who died for you and rose again to betroth you to myself. I'm reading this. You're reading this and we're reading the gospel. We're reading of the glories of our God who is worthy of praise, who is our Redeemer and our Savior. It's remes, it's there, it's there, but it's hidden. Every word we've read is true. But who's writing it? The Lord puts His signature on. So we read, it's read by this, it's, it's, it's being given right, to David by the Holy Spirit. He's writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As Peter says, that all Scripture right, is, 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 it comes from, from God, it's, it's inspired. And then the Lord just signs it. Aleph Tav. Alpha Omega. He puts his handprint. And do you know how many verses of Scripture are like this? There are multitudes in the Hebrew Scriptures where we see this pattern over and over again. Psalm 145 is one example of Remes. 
where below the Peshat is something more, something deeper. Another example is Psalm 119. Do you know that it has 22 sections, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet? Do you know that the first section begins with the letter Aleph? If you don't, just ch turn there and your Bible will say Aleph. Then the next section is Bet, and so on, all the way to Tav. And do you know that in every section, right, there are eight verses? 22 sections, Aleph, every line, so under Aleph, every line, every, every line of those eight verses all begins with Aleph. In the next session, Bet. Every sentence, every eight of those sentences begins with Bet. The next session, Gimel. All eight verses all begin with Gimel. Eight is a very important number in Scripture. Firstly, it's the number of covenant. On the eighth day, a Hebrew child was circumcised and became a son of the covenant. Jesus' resurrection. On the eighth day, Jesus reveals himself to Thomas. John chapter 20, verse 26. And then eternity begins on the eighth day as well. Revelation chapter 21. Eight, the number of eternity. Eight, the number of covenant. Eight, the number of divine new beginnings in God. Isn't that interesting? What is Psalm 119 about? The Word. Who is the Word? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. Psalm 119, it deals with the Word, the glory of the Word. Jesus is the Word. Alpha, the Alpha and Omega, Aleph and Tav, eight verses under each section. Number eight, covenant, perfect salvation, perfect new beginnings into eternity. Okay, that's what we call Remez. What time is it? I think it's, it's time for a break. Praise the Lord. We'll continue a bit later. Okay, yeah, take a break because we'll get a little bit deeper just now.